So I would like to share a story, a long story, but I'll make it short tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the story of collective intelligence. Uh, why collective intelligence? Well, because I guess as Aurovillians, collective intelligence applies every single moment of your, of your day. How do we make a, a city together? We know how to make small teams. We know how to make a sports team, a jazz band, a family, and it takes lots of training. But do we know how to make a big city together? Do we know how to make a civilization together? Do we know how to go beyond all the limitations that we know so far? And so I would like to share these questions with you through the story, and more especially the story of collective intelligence. Because when we know the story of collective intelligence, how collective intelligence evolved through time, then we can start to really understand what happens today. And what we can do today as individuals, as I in the we and also the we in the I. So I would like to go into this. And first, to share with you the main forms of uh, collective intelligence, more especially, so let me see if it works here, it should work, yes, okay. More especially the first form of collective intelligence, maybe the, the oldest one, the one that we call swarm collective intelligence swarm collective intelligence. So we don't see a swarm of fish here, but we see a school of fish. That means when nature invented these forms of collective where you have lots and lots of individuals together, but at the individual level you don't have a lot of freedom. You know the fish follows the fish. The ant has a specialized job and does, you know, as a worker or as a warrior, something, you know, that doesn't leave lots of freedom at the individual level. But at the collective level, you have an amazing level of freedom. And that form of collective intelligence, we probably have it as the oldest one as we know in the animal world. Okay, so ant colonies, uh, flocks, schools, schools of fish, flocks of birds, big herds when you have thousands of uh, animals, thousands of zebras or buffaloes in nature. We know this form of collective intelligence. Now, do we know it? as human beings in humanity? Does it happen in our species? Any idea? Yes? Yes, yes no, yes, no? <laughs> okay, well... <laughs> uh-huh. Well, let's uh, look at this one. New York Marathon. Okay, about 10,000 people running together. So, if you run, well, you run, <laughs> right? You don't go the opposite way. You follow the move. As an, individu as an individual, you don't have uh, much freedom other than, uh, than running. But together, you have a marathon. You, you accomplish something together. Now, another one that many people know. Oroville in five years. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, no, maybe not. Ten years. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. Yes, as individuals, we feel the frustration in our car when we, you know, in one of these cars here. However, you have a city that gets filled and emptied every day. Who could plan that at the collective level? So here you can see as this first form of collective intelligence, the specifics of this one, big numbers with a small individual freedom, but at a collective level, it can accomplish amazing things. You know, an ant colony has a huge, huge level of intelligence. But a, a single ant has a limited set of capacities. Okay? First form. The second form of collective intelligence, we call it original collective intelligence, because we come from that, our original form of collective intelligence as, a, as human beings. Okay? And as you can see here in this picture, we have the, uh, the kind of opposite of the swarm collective intelligence because you have a small number of people but with highly individualized individuals okay the monkey can do lots and lots of things so you can think of uh, you know elephants big cats um, uh, dolphins 
you know, many and some species of birds also, you know, like the, the geese who, who travel together, you know, when they migrate together, small groups, and with um, a perception, every individual has the perception of the whole. And we can see that when it applies to our species, you can uh, look at this jazz band here, and I really, really love this picture. I really invite you to, to go deep in this picture. First, we can, we can feel the empathy. We can connect to those people. We have the capacity to feel what they feel. What do we see? Well, first, we, we sense that every player has a connection with every other player, of course. How could you play otherwise? Also, every player plays and operates as a highly specialized player. You know, I play the trumpet or I play the piano, but I have some specific skill that I share with others. But more than that, in this picture, you have a very important property that we call holopticism. Holopticism, from the Greek holos, holistic, the whole, and opticism, see the whole. So every player here, and back to our jazz band here, every player has not only a, an, an individual training, like the pianist or the drummer, but also has the capacity to understand and to see and to visualize the whole. As a player, and I could have a picture with sports, the same thing, as a player, I can feel the whole, and because I can feel the whole, then I know what to do. So I always play an intersection between my skills, my personality, and my sense of the whole as a whole optician, because I feel the whole, okay? And I, I would really want to insist on that, because in this context, and you can really see that in this picture, this picture speaks for itself, you can really see that you have no conflict between collective interest and individual interest. They mutually feed one another. And yes, we, thi we, we think, yeah, of course, yes, but when it comes to big collectives, don't we get used to hear, you know, every, every time we speak about collectives, about politics, that we may have a conflict between individual interest and collective interest? So then we can maybe remember this original collective intelligence from where we come from, all the qualities all the dynamics that it has. So, now, this form of collective intelligence has uh, two limitations. It works first with a small number, so number as the first limitation. And second, you need to have people in the same room, or at least in the same space where they can really connect with one another. Uh, a group of wolves hunting a prey they still have a connection, although they may, they may run you know, from different distances, but they know what each other does because they have a connection. And they hunt with a small group of wolves, not 300 wolves, maybe 8, maybe 10, not 50. Sports, we have sports with 8, 10, 11, 15 players, not more. A village, a small village may have more people, but the pace goes slower. So we can have a little more people there, but when we have more and more people, then something different has to happen. Now what happens in nature when, let's say, you know, a group of big cats becomes bigger and bigger? What do they do, usually? How do they deal with the growth? Right, they part, they split up, they split up, yes, okay? But humanity found a different strategy. And we have to go back into history here when humanity faced the first global crisis ever. Yes, we have faced already a global crisis. Let's remember a little bit, I mean, in our long, 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 long back memory uh, in the past. Humanity moved from horticulture to agriculture. That means people started to live on the same place and to have a more and more complex society, you know? The same territory, then new cities emerging, job specialization as well, more and more complexity. How do you deal with complexity like that in an oral tradition? You can't. And so something had to happen in order to deal with this new level of complexity, and it came through a core technology, the writing. 
And because of the writing, suddenly you could go beyond the limitations of original collective intelligence. And it led to what we call the third form of collective intelligence, pyramidal, pyramidal collective intelligence. Pyramidal because, as you see, the first civilizations, they built big things like pyramids, of course, but they had a pyramidal and they still have a pyramidal structure. At the top, you have a living God, a CEO, a president, whatever you name it, and then you have different layers of society with centralized power, chains of command, and again, different layers, social classes or castes. Here in this picture, you can see the pharaoh on the top, and then you have, you know, the high priests and the nobles, and then you may have, you know, the artisans and the, um, the traders, and then you have at the next uh, level you have the people working on the land, the farmers or the herders, and then at the lower level you have unskilled workers, slaves, untouchable, whatever you name it. It started this way. Whether you look at early China, India, Mesopotamia, um, uh, Egypt, the Mayas, you know, all the um, pre-Columbian civilizations, you have this kind of structure. It started about 5,000, 6,000 years ago, and of course it evolved, but today, today, we still live in a world largely widely organized around pyramidal collective intelligence. So what does it do, this collect pyramidal collective intelligence? Well, it, it really accomplished a great, great thing, because it enabled thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of people to do something together for the worse or the better you know for the worse for war for you know anything horrible we've known in the past but also the better for building civilizations for sending you know spaceship into into uh, into space no original collective intelligence could ever do that So let me show you now something more recent. If we want to understand the structure of pyramidal collective intelligence, you have something more like this, a set of original collective intelligence. In a company, you could say you have you know, the board of directors, and then you have departments, and then you have services, but each time you have a group of people, a small group of people operating together because we still need to operate as individuals in original collective intelligence. In a city like Oroville and many other structures that try to go beyond these limitations, we still have you know, circles, committees, people making small groups and trying to coordinate together and trying to find the right balance between the pyramidal, vertical, top-down structure that has some level of efficiency, but also to reach something more horizontal. Why? Why do we face something like that? Some uh, trying to find a balance between pyramidal and something more horizontal. Well, pyramidal collective intelligence, just like original collective intelligence, has inner limitations. Some limitations, let me get a few examples. For instance, pyramidal collective intelligence works well in a stable environment when things don't really change. Because it does not really have, just look at the structure, it doesn't have many capacities to adapt itself, to reconfigure. Look at the sports team. It reconfigures all the time. It has a you know, polymorphic structure. It changes all the time. But this kind of structure does not have much capacity to readapt. It goes very, very slow. Also, the um, decision-making process happens at the, uh, at, the, at the top here. That means a small number of people. And that most small number of people, you know, they may have the best intentions in the world. How can they embrace super high levels of complexity when the world becomes chaotic and complex? How can they do that? Even they ha if they have skills and the best intentions in the world. How can, um, can they embrace a high level of complexity? They can't. Even more, now let me go a little deeper in, the, in those limitations of pyramidal collective intelligence. 
You see, pyramidal collective intelligence invented something very, very smart. What we call linear time. Linear time. That means, you know, we can speak about what will happen in two months, six months, five years, ten years, thirty years. Okay? We see time as a linear, as an arrow. Now, when we come back to original collective intelligence, and especially to, you know, primary people, you know, the aborigines and people living in the jungle who have never had any contact with pyramidal civilizations, they don't have, even in their language, they don't have any linear time. They have a circular time. Because if we think how we perceive time with our biological senses, we only perceive circular time. Na days and nights, life and death, seasons, you know, all the all the stars around us, it all goes circular. So the linear time came as, um, as a cultural invention. And pyramidal collective intelligence has made it so deep in our culture that we think we see linear time, we think we, we perceive linear time. Now why do I talk about linear time? Well, if you want to have chains of command that work, First, you need people to work on the linear time together. Six months, one year, ten years. But more than that, you need predictable people. Because if I work in any of these places here in this chain of command, I need to exist as a predictable person. Whether I say, no matter what happens to me, no matter what I want to do, this next Monday at 8 o'clock, I will show up and I will do my work and my job description. Okay? For whatever reasons, cultural, moral, duty, anything, look at a five years old child. A five years old child, you have a completely unpredictable little being. He wants to sleep, he sleeps. He wants to eat, he eats. He wants to play, he plays. He wants to cry, he cries. Okay? Completely unpredictable. You take this child, put him in a school, I mean, in the school of pyramidal collective intelligence. And 10 years, 15 years, 20 years later, you have someone who has learned how to become predictable. Maybe the most important task that schools do in the pyramidal world consists in making people predictable. How do they do that? Well, just like here, we sit. <laughs> And we get a huge, huge level of training to focus on a tunnel, what the teacher says, what the teacher writes on the, on the blackboard, and you please shut up, and so on. Stay on your seat, okay? Like that. Stay on your seat. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Now, serious. And so it, it trains the body and the mind first to really develop the mental capacities while separating yourself from the body. So pyramidal collective intelligence has created amazing skills, amazing people in the doing, and underdeveloped people in the being. School does not have, as a list of requirements, it never says, let's make people who know themselves in the being. It doesn't say that. I mean, conventional schools. They say, let's make people who can do things. Don't we, what do we ask our kids when they grow up? What will you do? What do you want to do later? You know? I mean, always about the, the doing. Do we ask, what will you be? You know, not that much. Okay? So, back to pyramidal collective intelligence. It's worse than that, because even when we ask, what do you want to be, we're talking about doing. We're not talking about Yes, thank you for, for pointing that. When we ask, uh, a child, what do you want to be? We mean doing, exactly. And when you go in the conventional world, uh, if you ask people, let's say, in, a, in, a, in the corporate world, who are you? And people say, I am an engineer, or I am a teacher, and so on. So the, the verb to be means that we take in the external social, social attribute and we take it in as our identity. And that comes as part of the predictability. And I will come back to that later, because it really speaks to what we, where we want to go next. But for now, I point on this limitation of pyramidal collective intelligence, because 
it really it can only exist if you have people very well developed in the doing and not so developed in the being because if they become too developed in the being then again you have unpredictable people how can you have a predictable social organization with super individualized people you can't on just thinking of on systems that means you create a chaotic system you, you create a system that you can't have control on that you can play with linear time with anymore how do we deal with that? So now this question can apply to our villains, people who want to become super individualized. That means they really develop their skills. They have the sense of self, I mean of true self. And together, how can they make a big organization without going into this, into this command and control thing, because it doesn't work. It can't deal with the level of complexity. So you see here, with these examples, we face this second global crisis at a, at a massive scale. Of course, you know, time-wise, it happens much faster than the first one, okay, because the first one happened with thousands of years. Here it happens with 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 years, super, super fast, however it happens. And so humanity now, because of this threshold, because of limitation, Something needs to happen, just like the something needed to happen with the writing, you know? A new innovation suddenly, you know, switched the whole thing and opened a new range of possibilities. Something seems about to happen, and that leads to the next form of collective intelligence that we can witness and see with our eyes and understand with our being. That fourth uh, form, we call it um, holomidal collective intelligence. Holomidal. That means holistic, a holistic structure. And if we make um, a picture, what we call SNA, social network analysis, and we try to track how people connect with one another. It doesn't have anything, you know, uh, anything collected to the pyramidal structure as we have seen it. We have something much more, much closer the, to the rhizome you know the rhizome, the rhizome when we go in a forest, all the connections we have under our feet, or the same kind of connection and connectedness like our brain, you know, the synaptic connections. Some collective that self-organizes itself without any boss deciding, you know, who should do what and how it should uh, organize itself. It just self-organizes it itself. And uh, when we try to have pictures of this social complexity. Here, for instance, you have a picture of the internet, already 10 years old, okay? But it shows, it shows more and more this kind of holomidal structure that we can see through SNA. And we can even compare, you know, the old structure, the pyramidal collective intelligence structure, which you can see here. You see, with my, a little bit of experience, and with my experience, if someone shows me this, this, uh, this picture here and asks me, what kind of collective intelligence do you see here? I would immediately say pyramidal. Why? Because you have silos here. Silos, you know, disconnections, parts. Parts that don't communicate with other parts. You can see already something quite organized, you know, some, uh, maybe a, uh, a department here communicating with another department here, but not this one, and so on. So you can see a very organized and siloed kind of structure. Now if you put next to this one, this one here, hard to see on the screen, but you have uh, pictures, pictures of people. And you see that we have a much more complex kind of social organization. This new form of collective intelligence that we call holomidal collective intelligence. How does it work? Well, first, just like the writing for the pyramidal collective intelligence, we want to track what kind of core technology makes it possible. What kind of core technology? The internet. Yes. Okay. It means networks with this kind of software that enable self-organization. They have a name. We call them community wear or social wear. These softwares, this connected, interconnected software that enable people to connect with one another 
and self-organize themselves. It means make, dec make decisions together, um, have a collective memory, uh, drive complex projects, uh, resolve conflicts, you know, all these kinds of things to administrate everyday life. Now, this uh, kind of collective intelligence, the holomidal collective intelligence, works locally and globally. Locally and globally, okay? It means a city like Oroville, if Oroville evolves towards the holomidal collective intelligence, it means a very well connected city inside where lots of projects, lots of uh, state of the art of the city, as individuals, you can see it, you can watch it. Remember? Holopticism, as individual, you can see the whole. That means that with social wear, you can connect with the internet and see what others in your community do at the present moment. You can see the collective state of the art of the city or of your organization, but you can also see how it connects itself with the rest of the world. Because what you guys do here in Oroville Many other people do it also in the rest of the world. Whether you have a question about energy, social engineering, um, education, healthcare, you certainly have this kind of people, this kind of social networks working on these questions, where you have ideas, innovation, and lots and lots of things happening there. So holomidal collective intelligence works very, very, very differently than pyramidal. First, as I said, it has a different structure, more like the brain. Second, you have super individualized people there because then it can manage social complexity that emerged because of individualized people. Third, it has a different economy. You see, in the pyramidal world, one of the other things that the pyramidal collective intelligence invented, it invented the market economy with currencies, okay? So I give you something, but you have something to give me back as currency or as something equivalent in value on which we both agree, all right? So market economy means that we have a symmetrical relationship. I give you something, you give me something back, done. We have done the deal, okay? In the original collective intelligence, we have the gift economy. The gift economy, technically speaking, means that I give you something, I give you my book, and, well, you will help your neighbor, you know, fix his roof, and you will help the kids of this neighbor for school, and so on, and maybe something will come back to me in a different time, a different quality, a different quantity, so we can call it an asymmetrical kind of economy. As a system, it has much more complexity than the market economy. The market economy works with a big condition. I give only and only if someone has reciprocal to give me. If I don't see the reciprocity, I will never give. In the gift economy, I don't have this kind of condition of reciprocity. So that makes it a very, very, very powerful system. But again, we have, have only managed this kind of system with small communities in original collective intelligence. The explosion of complexity of pyramidal collective intelligence, we could only deal it with market economy. But now, the next step, back to holomidal collective intelligence, it needs more complexity. So, it needs to also go back into a mutualistic economy where we share resources, we have the sense of the whole, just like in the a gift economy. We want to have more complex relationship with a wider sense of wealth because wealth does not consist in just stuff. Quality of air, quality of life, trust, joy, and all these things. So how do we organize an economy, an integral economy in the holomidal uh, collective intelligence? Well, this these things just happened now. Because holomidal collective intelligence just began a few years ago. So just, it operates like a newborn. We haven't seen it already, okay? But however, 
it still plays with the conventional market economy with money, with a scarce money, with a built-in scarcity in it. But still, yet now, it looks for its next phase, its next step with the economy. It needs mutualistic economy with free people connected to the environment, connected in an integral way with other beings, with the flow of life, all these things that market economy with conventional money cannot do. So, in this very moment, if you investigate, you will see that many people in the world, like me and like others, work on the post-monetary society. That means we work on the post-monetary technologies. Things that will enable thriving economies to work without the limitations of conventional money. That means without the limitations of this old, old technology that worked well for pyramidal collective intelligence, but that does not work well at all for holomidal collective intelligence. So, here comes the story. Back to a long time ago, swarm collective intelligence, then original collective intelligence, then humanity created pyramidal collective intelligence, and now we hit a wall, a limitation, and something new emerges. And a city like Oroville, I really see it exactly at this intersection. As individuals, we come with, you know, questions of how do I become myself? How do I become individualized? How do I listen to my true self, my true nature? And others do the same, but how do we do that together? How do we deal with this level of complexity that it has? What kind of answers, what kind of social practice, what kind of technologies do we need to manage this social complexity? We don't even have a language for social engineering. And one of the things that I do as a researcher, the first step consists in putting words for social engineering. You know, we don't make airplanes fly with conventional language. They would just crash because we don't have enough precision. Well, same thing with social engineering. We need a very super sharp, precise kind of language so that we can design those holomidal structures for tomorrow that we need, where we have individualized people managing, managing the complexity of the world, managing the complexity of their city or their territory. So all these things that I share, you can investigate them, of course, on the internet. I just put words on those different forms of collective intelligence. But if you want to see the post-monetary society, the evolution of the after-money thing, you will find information. If you want to see how the next societies will deal with energy, for instance, go on the internet, connect yourself, and you will see, of course, lots and lots of things. If you want to see how education can evolve, healthcare, sci science, arts, and so on, we all have it available now on the internet, and we can connect as holomidal beings, you know, to these things, and then bring it back to our physical space and the physical reality. It also raises a question, how will we organize, how we will build this next society with the right balance between the physical life, like here in this room, like, you know, gardening, like living with our neighbors, with our kids, going to school and all these things. So the physical life and the online life. That space that we spend with other people, some of them far away, but they have ideas to share and projects to share, but also with people in the same neighborhood because we have to manage a huge level of complexity. Just think of the complexity of Oroville, the level of complexity it has, and how, you know, community wear and social wear will enable new capacities to manage this level of complexity. So how do we have the right balance between those two realities, the physical reality and the online reality? What social codes will we have? How do I stay present to myself? How do I not lose myself, my body, my emotions, my channeling, my spiritual being, my true self, 
when I operate in the computer, for instance. We have to invent all these things. <laughs>